Picture this. You're driving in your brand new car, surfing from station to station and just feeling on top of the world. Suddenly the car in front of you slams on its brakes. You respond by doing the same but the car behind you is just a bit too slow. You feel a slight jolt forward and for a moment, all is fine. Then ignited by the lightest touch, the car unexpectedly bursts into flames. In the United States, around 5 people die every single minute. Among other things such as diseases and suicide, vehicle-related injuries are a leading cause of death, which makes sense. The United States is, after all, the country with the highest driving population. To keep the millions of drivers safe, the government imposes strict requirements on car manufacturers. But what happens when those regulations aren't followed or, worse, don't even exist? The story I'm going to tell you today is of a quaint little economy car with a kill count in the dozens. How did it claim the lives of so many people? Why was it so dangerous? And was this the most dangerous car in history? We'll answer all that and more as we examine the tragic legacy of the Ford Pinto. Pinto strong, built to run and run and run. Pinto turns in a smaller circle than the leading import. It's the little car with the wider stance. It's a little better in a lot of ways. In the late 1960s, the Ford Motor Company decided that their sales had stalled too much and devised a plan to boost their numbers. And it was completely reliant on creating a vehicle with all the new bells and whistles a consumer could ask for while also being significantly cheaper than most other cars on the market. The board members decided that this car would have to cost less than $2,000 in order to attract buyers. If that sounds dirt cheap, that's just about under $15,000 today. Plenty of money to get a decently fuel-efficient and spacious car. Ford's other priority was ensuring that this new car was manufactured in the United States. If you drove a car in the 60s, chances are it was a foreign import, assembled in another country and shipped to America to be sold. Because car manufacturing had mostly been done overseas, there were very few safety rules for products being created domestically. And what little regulation existed was easily circumvented by big companies with a well-placed dollar. Because for corporations, a fine for breaking the rules was a worthy trade-off. So Ford had their ideas in place, a small compact car, manufactured in the United States, and costing no more than two grand. This would become the Ford Pinto, a car meeting all of those goals. The Pinto went on sale in 1970 and sold almost half a million units in its first year on the market. Now, fast forward a few years to the summer of 1972 and examine the scenario described at the beginning of the video. A young woman named Lily Gray and her passenger, 13-year-old Richard Grimshaw, are driving down a street in the recently released Ford Pinto when the car suddenly falters. Lily tries to press the pedal, but the car's engine just sputters. And then from behind, a car fails to brake in time, striking the rear of the motionless car at a low speed. A fireball instantly erupts from the Pinto as the fuel tank in the back is ruptured by the collision, causing fuel vapors to fill the air while sparks from the metal ignites the gas. Richard Grimshaw suffers permanent disfiguring scars, while Lily Gray survives for another few hours in agony before unfortunately succumbing to her injuries. The family of Richard Grimshaw wasted no time in filing a lawsuit against Ford after the incident claiming that the Pinto was dangerous and that Ford did not take proper steps to ensure its safety. To win against a corporate conglomerate, the Grimshaws knew they would need the power of public sentiment to back them. On every news station that would have them, to any person that would listen, the families of Richard and Lily would relentlessly blame Ford for their negligence. People began to look at the company with a new perspective influenced by the evidence that the Grimshaws produced against them. One of the big pieces of evidence that Ford knew the car was dangerous was the timeline of its launch. The first signs of trouble began just a couple of months after the release. Citing an error in the brakes that caused cars to be unable to stop, Ford recalled a few thousand units to fix the issue. No hard feelings, right? Wrong. About a year later, Ford recalled another 200,000 units to fix another issue. This time the problem was in the engine, where a malfunction allowed fuel vapors to leak where they could be ignited and cause massive damage to the car and anyone or anything around it. Sound familiar? Additionally, Ford's environmental and safety engineering division at one point had created this cost-benefit analysis that heavily argued against stricter regulations of the industry. 
For the most part, the US government didn't really take action to rein in vehicle companies, fearing that any interference would be perceived as a communist takeover. As a result, products such as Ford's Pinto were put into the production pipeline with few safety measures in place. Despite this evidence, critics of the lawsuit argued that accidents were just an unfortunate part of driving, and that while tragic, fatalities will happen regardless of the product. Were they? Well, that infamous cost-benefit analysis was commonly cited as evidence of Ford's guilt. And on the surface, a company with a supposedly dangerous car arguing against stricter rules seemed to be an open and shut case of profit over life. Besides, Ford had followed the existing rules, right? Technically true, but as stated before, those regulations were flimsy at best. Additionally, the memo was written years after the Pinto was first released and only recently popularized meaning that it couldn't actually have affected the design for the car's fuel tank. Most people were not aware of that, however, and Ford's fate was sealed. Their image had taken a massive beating, and after a lengthy trial, the jury ordered Ford to pay over $125 million in damages, with another $2.5 million to Richard Grimshaw and half a million to the family of Lily Gray. The memo clearly had a major effect on the outcome of the case, as it was seen as callous and disregarding of human life by both the jury and the general public. In the years following the trial, many experts said that the document's publication was the only reason the case was decided in favor of Grimshaw. With their reputation heavily damaged in both the court of law and public opinion, Ford chose to settle out of court and spent the next several years bolstering their legal defenses to prevent another loss. Nobody could have predicted the question being asked during the next major Ford trial. Could a company be charged with a murder? This question would be put to the test in 1978 in the trial of Indiana v. Ford. That same year, three teenage girls were killed in a light rear-end collision while driving the Pinto. A grand jury indicted Ford on three counts of reckless homicide, the first time a corporation had ever faced murder charges. This time, however, the legal defense was significantly more planned. A big difference in the case this time around was public sentiment. Indiana v. Ford would set the precedent for whether or not a company could be charged and convicted of non-white-collar crimes such as homicide. Given the nature of the case, public support for the plaintiffs was much weaker than it was during the Grimshaw case. After another lengthy trial, Ford was acquitted of all charges. Although they were found not guilty, Ford still had to confront reality. Almost 30 deaths had been tied to the Pinto, their sales had dropped dramatically, their public reputation was withering away, and it was only a matter of time until they were actually found guilty of a crime. Because of this, the Ford Pinto line was dropped in 1980 after a decade-long run. So, was the Ford Pinto the most dangerous car in history? Maybe. The answer is complicated. Some statistics suggest it only had a slightly above average fatality rate. Regardless, what really matters here is that it was perceived as incredibly dangerous by the public. While the legal system may have let Ford slip from its grasp, the publicity over the incidents and safety concerns caused the federal government to finally increase regulation of car production, despite lobbying from the auto industry, of course. For example, Congress passed a law mandating that the national drinking age be raised to 21 in an effort to combat unsafe driving practices. Additionally, the deaths caused by the car prompted federal agencies to tighten the rules on vehicles altogether. Seeing the writing on the wall, other companies took note of how media attention shaped the case, with many making preparations to spin narratives in their favor if the need ever arose. Trials such as the famous McDonald's coffee case are great examples of how corporations influence the portrayal of events to benefit themselves. The next decade also saw the signing of several new laws designed to shield corporations from liability. Of course, lobbied for by those same corporations. The legacy of the Ford Pinto is a cautionary tale for every industry. A warning that there may be severe consequences for taking shortcuts and cutting corners. A warning that if they aren't careful, their profits may just go up in flames. Thanks for watching.